Your AC works overtime all summer, so be sure to replace your old air filters with new Filtry air filters. They recommend updating HVAC filters at least every three months all year round. So order your Filtry air filters today at Filtry.com. Let's clear the air. Worried about mom or dad falling? The Symphony Medical Alert System from CVS Health helps make their home safer, even if you can't be there. Symphony works with voice activation or a care button they can opt to wear along with smart sensors for coverage around the home. With 24-7 emergency response and an app to tie it all together, you can monitor your loved one's well-being for enhanced peace of mind. Terms and conditions apply. Learn more about Symphony at cvs.com slash symphony or find it at your nearest CVS Health Hub. One of my major stress reliefs is just to head out somewhere and make a bell drill fire. You know, there's a lot of energy expended there. And, you know, it, it kind of centers me. You know, if I'm, if I'm in a bad mood, it just kind of brings me back. Hey, folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason Gravely. You know, one of my favorite things to do is uh, kind of like what Mo- Joe mentioned at the beginning of this and that little sound bite you heard is build a campfire. I absolutely love campfires. I am often found in my backyard with a campfire coming in late at night smelling like smoke. There's just something about it that helps you recenter, helps you just relax, helps me at least to to think about things, think through problems or just kind of zone out for a little bit. And, you know, that's just one aspect of uh, wilderness survival skills is being a, being able to build a fire. And so I know this show is typically about adventure sports stories, but, you know, wilderness survival skills are ob- obviously very important. Uh, they're fun to talk about, even if you never use them. They're just fun. They're just fun to do. It's it's exciting. It's it's a craft, you know, that that's really fun. And Joe here knows a lot about it, but this is an episode from 2016. Kurt was the host. This is Throwback Thursday, by the way, as you as you already know. And also, you just never know when you might need some of these skills or just some some of the know how, especially if you're in the backcountry a lot or you get hurt. I've I met friends and I, we, we you know we get hurt all the time uh, on trips, so it's just nice to know some of these things for those for those occasions. And outside of being hurt, another thing you need for an experience is good gear. And so that's why I am excited to continue um, promoting rerouted.co. They are an amazing platform for buying and selling used gear. I'm a huge proponent of used gear. I'm a yard sale fan. I love estate sales. I love, love, love getting things used. In fact, the shirt I got on right now came from a yard sale because I love used stuff. One, it's unique. Two, it's a heck of a lot cheaper. And three, it just feels good to keep things out of the landfill. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's so many, so many wins, not a lot of downsides. So if you have gear that you want to get rid of that you think someone else could use on their adventure, go to rerouted. Dot co that's r e r o u t e d dot co or if you look if you're looking for something specific definitely check there first they've got a lot of really unique stuff and at great prices you know way less than you're going to be spay- paying in some of these big stores um, for stuff that works just as well as the stuff on rerouted check that out um, and yeah let's learn a little bit about some wilderness survival skills all right here's the episode. Today, I have Joe Mobley with us, and Joe is here to take uh, the Adventure Sports podcast kind of in a new direction. You know, we all love adventure sports. That's why we make the show. It's why you listen to the show. But adventure sports normally take people outside and away from all of the services and securities that we're accustomed to. Uh, Whether you're riding a motorcycle, mountain biking, backcountry skiing, mountain climbing, camping, backpacking, it doesn't matter. You're, You're removing yourself from all of those, I guess, societal safeties, right? And I think anyone that does adventurous things like this eventually finds himself or herself in a situation where they have to rely on their wits and on their skills to get out of a bind and to get through safely. 
And to that end, Joe Mobley has been studying bushcraft skills and wilderness survival skills for quite a while and has developed a a YouTube channel where he reviews products and talks a lot about bushcraft called Feral Woodcraft. And Joe is here to talk to us about wilderness survival and about uh, what to do when things don't go right and we have to work our way out of the woods, so to speak. So, Joe, welcome to the program. It's an honor to be here, Kurt. Thanks for having me. I met Joe because he reviewed one of our 180 stoves, and as I watched his review, I said, well, this guy knows what he's doing. Uh, We've had a lot of people review our stoves, Joe, and I mentioned to you on email, some of them it's clear that they really don't understand how to work with nature efficiently, and some people just by watching the way that they work with our stoves, it's clear that they have a lot of skill, and you're one of those people that I'm sure I can learn things from, so... I contacted Joe and said, hey, would you be on the show? Because I feel like this is a a subject that's valuable, and it could save lives. And so that was the reason, Joe, that I wanted to have you on. Now, Joe lives in western North Carolina. So, Joe, tell us about the the environment there, what it's like, so people can have a context for where you do your stuff. Well, basically around here, it's a lot of pine trees with a smattering of, say, poplar, maple, um, and you have a few others, but for the most part, at least where I live in Western, Western North Carolina, we basically have pine trees to work with, um, rolling Hills. We're just at the foothills of the Appalachian mountains. Um, so flat terrain in the woods is not too often to be had, um, yeah, crazy different weather, you know, it can be raining one minute and, you know, sunny the next, um, there are areas, you know, little microclimates that are basically considered a rainforest. Um, as you get further up in altitude, the, the trees change from, you know, pine trees to, uh, again, going back to poplar, and then you have some birch trees. And it's just uh, this general area in Western North Carolina is really diversified. So just because you're in one area now and you're familiar with it, that's one thing I love. You go, say, 10 miles in a different direction, it can be totally different. Well, and that's an area, too, where I think people, they don't expect to find themselves lost, like you can get lost in some of the huge wilderness areas, you know, out west. But the reality is the undergrowth is thick, the vegetation is thick, and people do get turned around in those areas. I think it might be more difficult to find your way there and around the Appalachians than perhaps in the Rockies. Well, I haven't spent a whole lot of time in the Rockies. Uh, I have on a couple different occasions, but it was all trail hikes and stuff like that. So, you know, it was clear where you, where you needed to go and, you know, what area to stay in if you're wanting to find a certain path. Um, but here, you know, especially at night, um, even during the daytime, sometimes depending on where you're at and what time of year, but especially at night, all the woods look the same. So yes, it is, it is pretty easy at times to get turned around. Even if you're in a small area, it's pretty easy to get turned around and not know how to get out. Um, one of the saving graces here is, um, I don't know if you've ever been in a plane on the Eastern seaboard, there are lights everywhere. So, um, where there's lights, people are living, there's roads. Um, so often, uh, if you just walk in a straight line, you'll eventually run into a road, um, which can you know lead you out. But um, it's not always the case. Hmm. Well, let's rewind a little bit, Joe. I want to learn more about who Joe Mobley is. Um, you have a, a family there, four kids and a wife. You've been married for 14 years. You're 38 years old. Um, tell us a little bit more about Joe. <laughs> What's to tell? Uh, like I told you before, I don't talk about myself very well. Um, you, you hit the high points. I'm an IT um, bushcraft has been a hobby slash passion of mine for probably around six or seven years, something like that. Um, I grew up in Eastern Texas, um, and from a young age, uh, just because of, um, my family's lifestyle back then, I spent, uh, an enormous amount of time outside in the woods behind our house and, um, loved nature as a kid all, all through growing up. And, uh, it eventually developed into, like I said, this passion or hobby called bushcraft, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, Aside from exploring that that passion in my life, um, I'm pretty much a, a homebody, a family man. I spend as much time with my kids as I can and my wife and just try to um, give them the best upbringing as I can. Oh, that's fun. So you also mentioned that you were in Boy Scouts. Yes, sir. And that you uh, you did that up to about the point of Eagle Scout. Is that right? You know, it's been so long, I forget. I wasn't that far away from Eagle. I had w- one or two more requirements. And then we ended up moving from Texas to Western North Carolina. And uh, by the time we found a troop that, you know, I got along with and they got along with me and all that stuff, we found a good troop home. Um, I moved from a homeschool environment that I was used to into a public school environment during that move. And um, I wouldn't say I lost interest. 
um, I would say more so I lost time more than more so than anything else to actually finish it up. It, it's one of those things in my life that I really regret. I wish I would have applied myself more back then to finish it up, but um, I didn't. So, Well, one thing I'm curious about, scouting is wonderful. I'm going to start out that way. I love the way that it gets kids out into nature, and it serves its purpose. They have to keep groups of kids safe, so I know they have to be very conservative about a lot of things, but they do teach a lot of great skills. But just in your opinion, I'm curious, how much of your bushcraft did you learn from scouting versus what you learned after scouting when you decided to dig in on your own? Honestly, I would say very little. The main thing that, that comes to mind would be knots and probably first aid. But beyond that, as far as, you know, fire making, shelter building, um, crafting, you know, the crafting side of bushcraft, um, I would say not really. Now, but at the same time, I do want to kind of reiterate in, over the last 25 years when having friends that had kids that were in scouts and just what you see on the news and just, uh, you know, observations, every troop is different um, in what they teach their kids, how they teach their kids. So, you know, that's just the experience that I have. I'm not generalizing Boy Scouts overall, but uh, as far as my experience as a kid, um, very little of what I quote unquote know now came from Boy Scouts. Well, the reason I mention that, it's not to uh, speak ill of Boy Scouts because I think it's wonderful what scouting does. But I think that their focus might be a little bit more on on developing these kids and teaching them how to do safe activities in nature and a little less on the details of wilderness survival and that sort of thing. And the reason I point that out is some parents may say, well, my kid's been in scouts, so life is good. But the reality is there are a lot of skills left to learn in, in, in a lot of cases. I would agree completely with that. I think scouting is a good, I would say is a good foundation, a good stepping off point. And I think, uh, at least from what I grew up in, I can't say for today, but I think what I grew up in, it was a, a good social foundation as well. You know, it was a healthy environment, you know, good leaders, good peers, um, made a lot of friends and, you know, had a lot of good times. From scouting, you, uh, you ended up getting into more of the wilderness survival and even a prepper mindset. Tell us how that happened. Wilderness survival, uh, from a fictional standpoint, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book and I'm drawing a blank on the author's name, but it's called the ax. It's about a boy who, uh, crashes in a plane in Alaska. Um, I ran it, I ran into that book and eventually the movie as a younger teenager. And, you know, it whetted my palate, so to speak, to continue on finding, you know, fictional stories in, in that genre. And, uh, as far as the prepping aspect, um, back during the Y2K thing, my parents, uh, I was 17 or 18 at the time and my parents, you know, they believed the hype, which I'm not faulting them. You know, I did too, um, about the whole, you know, the world coming to an end because of a couple extra zeros. But, uh, anyway, they started putting back water and a little bit of food and, you know, just being prepared for that event and, uh, it basically stayed the same mindset since, you know, and, uh, eventually I came to the point where I realized that, you know, while it's not a, uh, a looming thing or probably not even a real, uh, likelihood of a thing, if there's a, you know, event big enough to kind of slow society down or shut the infrastructure down for, you know, two, three, four weeks, you know, unless you have an infinite amount of funds to put stuff back. Um, people are going to have to start relying on themselves to provide what they need aside from, you know, what they can get, you know, in Walmart. And, uh, that led me to the conclusion of, you know, going back to nature, you know, living how people did a long time ago and, uh, learning how to live off the land, find your food, sanitize water, you know, and if need be, if you, you know, live in nature. Sure. I want to go back to the Y2K thing. It's kind of funny. I was in the wireless industry at the time. And, you know, people yawn and say, yeah, that just shows that, you know, it's a lot of hype. Well, the reality was in the wireless industry, we spent over a year doing um, substantial upgrades to the software and infrastructure to make sure that when Y2K happened, that nothing went wrong. And, you know, when the calendar rolled over to 2000, we had people on call watching the systems to see if they actually survived or not. And so the reason that Y2K was not the catastrophe is that someone had the foresight to say, you know what, we could have a problem here. And over a year was spent upgrading um, infrastructure and programming, not just in the wireless industry, but also in the in the power industry and other places. So I think the reality is that Y2K was a near miss. And I don't yeah, want to sound like I'm hyping it up, but it really was. I would agree with you from all I know about it. And really, I think if people look into things, you know, there's a lot of near misses out there. Um, so, I mean, how close to a near miss they are is, you know, is dependent on the event and what is done about them. 
there are the people that are the doomsdayers who, are, who say that society is going to collapse, and let's hope and pray that that never happens, Joe. But the reality really? is that smaller accidents and unexpected events are common, and they happen all the time. Whether it's a bad storm that knocks out the power, or if you get lost in the woods, or, you know, as I was alluding to in the beginning, maybe you're backcountry skiing and, and get yourself caught in a storm, or, or you lose visibility and you find you have to spend the night, that sort of thing. There are a, a number of ways that adventurers can find themselves needing to lean back on nature craft, bushcraft type skills to get through a bind. So anyway, regardless of whether we ever have a large scale emergency or not, it's worthwhile to learn these skills. And besides that, it's a ton of fun. I would agree completely. Like uh, as we were talking before the show, as I told you several times, you know, what my exploring this uh, wilderness survival and bushcraft, you know, I started it because of an interest of taking care of my family if, you know, the bad ever happens, but it, it quickly turned into a passion. Um, so it's not really focused on the necessarily the survival aspect of it anymore. It's I just love the learning and I love the activity of it. Well, hey, let's uh, let's stop for just a minute and consider what it means to be self-reliant in the woods. Some of the greatest explorers in human history had to be self-reliant in the woods. The pioneers. I mean, you go all the way back to Lewis and Clark, right? Had they not had extensive skills, they would have had a hard time doing what they did. Um, change the scenery a little bit. What about Ernest Shackleton? And what happened in Antarctica with with him and his men? Um, the greatest explorers on the planet have always had to rely on their skills and wits to get through. And so, I think it's just bushcraft skills go hand in hand with what it means to be an adventurer. And so let's let's put together a situation. So, Joe, let's say that someone is out in nature. They could be doing almost any adventure sport that's nature related. And weather changes, they can't get back to their vehicle or to their house what should they do? What are the first steps that they should do to uh, to survive in a catastrophe? My opinion, everybody's opinion is going to be different, but my opinion is stop immediately and evaluate, number one, to their best guess, where are they? Number two, what you have on hand. And number three, what do you need? That would be my, my first step. Um, beyond that, you know, a lot of it's weather related. Um, a lot of it's uh, related to what you have with you. I mean, it's a game changer. If you have you know, two quarts of water with you, water is not necessarily an immediate need. The same goes for food. If you have a couple meals of food, you know, food is not an immediate need. Um, so if you have a tent with you or a tarp or, you know, a hammock set up, you know, shelter is not an immediate need. Um, it, it all depends on what you have. So let's say you assess your situation and, and it's getting cold and you don't have the tarp and you don't have the tent. Again, it goes back to area dependent. Um, it, here, that's really a toss up what your priorities are. I would say if it's wet or looking like it's going to be wet, shelter should probably be your first priority and then worry about your fire. Um, if it's not going to be wet and depending on how cold it is, fire should be your first priority. There is no hard set recipe for survival or what you should do in any particular incident. Um, a lot of survival is thinking on your feet, evaluating what you have and then setting your priorities accordingly. You know, I've long argued that um, hypothermia is probably the, the most urgent threat in most situations in Colorado anyway, because it gets cold every night, even in, at altitude in the summer. I mean, you're going to you're gonna have freezing temperatures. So finding a way to conquer hypothermia seems like a, an important problem to solve, whether it becomes a real problem or not. And so that can be done with insulation, shelter, and fire. If someone said, okay, I, uh, I think I'm going to be dry, and I want to build a fire, what are the benefits of having a fire? And how, how can they start a fire in the woods if they didn't come prepared with, you know, matches and all that stuff? Well, my first go-to, you know me, is going to be probably a bow drill set. Um, and I, I hate to keep on repeating myself, but a lot of the method, met, or at least methodology, is going to be area and resource dependent. Um, if you don't have any trees, I mean, depending on what altitude you're at, if you're above the tree line, uh, your options for fire are pretty limited. Um, but, you know, if you're down uh, lower, and I'm assuming in your part of Colorado, you have a lot of spruces, a lot of pines and stuff like that. Um, depending on how resinous they are, you're going to have a hard time getting them going. Um, but yeah, my first go-to without a modern way of starting a fire would be a bow drill. The bow drill setup has, has been used for thousands of years by humans to make a fire. But I would challenge anybody, even if you give them a bow and a drill with the right kind of wood, to make a fire on their first try or their 10th try for that matter. You know, I've uh, met or talked to quite a few people that claimed that they had done on their first try and that it was easy. 
I'm probably going to upset quite a few people here, but that's usually the first sign that someone's never done it. <laughs> um, so I'm not saying nobody out there has never done it on the first try. It's possible, but it's going to be rare. I think what really matters is the the materials you have to work with. The reason I bring it up this way, though, is not to say that it's impossible, but just to say that for someone who likes adventure sports, um, learning how to make a bow drill fire is probably a really good safety skill to have. But don't think that you can read it in a book, and then if you find yourself in a bind, you'll be able to do it. Um, exactly. It takes practice, and it takes uh, learning the nuances it's a coordination issue in a lot of cases. Yeah. It's like learning to play a, a pool or something. You know, you can't yeah. you can't shoot a perfect game of pool until you've played a thousand games or more. And uh, learning how to make a fire with a bow and drill is is similar to that in the sense that you have to develop that dexterity and that coordination. Exactly. There's there's a lot of muscle memory involved. And I'll take it even a step further when you're when you're uh, putting it to it's something you have to practice. You know, you can't do it, you know, four or five times successfully and say, okay, I've got that skill in the bag. If you, it's a skill you have to maintain or you start to lose it. Um, and a lot of that being there's, uh, unless you're a really strong person, your muscles have to get used to the a proper amount of pressure in certain places and, um, the stamina to continue doing it until you get that coal. And, uh, you know, if you don't practice, at least with me, you know, I, I run a desk, I'm an IT if I don't constantly practice, you know, I start losing that edge. Sure, you bet. So that just kind of points out with the, one of the first things that we would do in a survival situation might be to build a fire. And it just goes to show that even that takes skill and practice. People don't often realize that um, these things are not automatic. So it can be so much fun, though, to develop these skills. So let's go I on agree. to the next one. Um, let's say that either it's going to get wet or it is wet and, you know, you need to have a shelter, then how are you going to make a shelter, Joe, if you don't have a tarp or a tent or something like that? Well, going back to what seems to be my standby here, it really depends on your area. Um, depends on what resources you have available. That is the number one. What resources, what resources you have is really the number one uh, key to determining what gets done in a survival situation. Here, uh, it'd be fairly simple. Um, you know, just you can find uh, downed trees pretty much everywhere. Just set up some sort of a lean-to, uh, pile debris on top of it, and pile leaves on top of that till it's, you know, at least three three foot thick. And people would be surprised that type of rubbish hut, as some people call it, um, that can insulate a person even without a coat. You can be relatively comfortable in temperatures well below freezing. Um, yeah, and it it can really make a huge difference. Yeah, the key to that is really. Is controlling the amount of airspace in there. Keep it low to the ground. Have good insulation on, on the floor of your shelter, but keep it low so there's not a bunch of air above you or and a, not a bunch of area for wind to come in the front. Sure. And another point with that type of a shelter or a snow shelter too is that you just disappeared. You're invisible now. Um, people that are looking for you will have a very difficult time spotting you if you're inside of a rubbish hut because it looks like a pile of leaves that blew up against a log. Exactly. And so... If you're wanting to be found, always put something up hi as high as you can reasonably get it where it can be spotted, something bright and flashy like a bandana or, or a jacket or, or a pack or something where if you're going into a rubbish hut or into a snow cave and you want to be found, that people need to be able to see where you are. Exactly. Well, Joe, let's talk a little bit about feral woodcraft. You started feral woodcraft when you got into learning these skills. How did that develop? Uh, feral woodcraft, like like I've told you before, it didn't really have a name back then. Um, it was just a medium to uh, share what I was learning with a group of friends of mine online. Um, and we all kind of ran little little teeny tiny YouTube channels uh, doing the same thing, you know, just showing, you know, where I'm at with uh, this particular type of wood on the bow drill or this shelter setup or, you know, whatever. And just to just share our techniques because it was a lot easier to do it that way than it was to try to type things out or post a, a couple of pictures. And then it just over time, um, as my experience and knowledge grew, um, it turned into what it is today, um, where share what I know, which I'm not claiming to be an expert or anything like that, but share what I know with a YouTube audience as well as, you know, share my gear experience with them through, through reviews. So the name of your... YouTube channel is, it is Feral Woodcraft, isn't it? Yes, sir. Um, it came to a point, I don't know, probably 18 months or two years ago, where I felt like um, it needed a name. 
And uh, that's what I came up with. Um, basically, woodcraft, uh, I, because I like that word better than bushcraft, honestly. And uh, feral, it's, uh, you know, it's a take on wild. Um, you know, I, I look at my take on bushcraft, woodcraft, survival as not a cookie cutter version. Um, I like to learn things for myself, find my own way. Um, so a lot of what I do is probably a little bit abnormal or I have my own twist on what you would consider the, the mainstream uh, bushcraft or survival community. I think it's fun that as someone develops their survival skills, they, they develop a, a relationship with nature and a philosophy. And mine is different than a lot of people's that I know. And it's not that one is more wrong or more right than the other, but you find something that is a, a comfortable way of doing things that works for you. And an example of this might be that I am much more about taking knowledge into the woods than taking gear into the woods. I think that some types of gear are critical and, and very helpful, and but you just can't always carry it all. But if you take right. the know-how and the skills and the experience into the woods, then a lot of the gear you can leave at home, you travel lighter, and you end up working with nature instead of sheltering yourself from nature or hiding from nature. So that's my personal philosophy. It's more of a Native American approach, I, I believe, to to nature than a lot of the modern approaches. But where does yours fall in that continuum? I would say I fall right, right behind you. You know, I put out about three videos a week, so, you know, I do a lot of filming. Um, but if I'm not going out into the woods with a bunch of camera gear, um, depending on what I'm doing, I have the bare necessities. I mean, it's going to be usually a knife and a bottle of water, and then I just go have fun. I mean, I'm not saying I go spend time out there, you know, and survive off that with, for days. But, uh, you know, it's uh, one of those things where I take just what I need. It provides for a better experience, in my opinion. Scavenging re resources that you have, it, it kind of forces you to open your eyes and, and uh, see what is around you more than if you have brought everything, you know, that you have in your house with you. It just, if you do that, it just takes away from the experience. Sure. It's a, it's a glorified motel room. <laughs> and I wanted to mention to our listeners, I forgot to mention earlier, Joe is in the woods right now. We're recording with him um, sitting in the forest on his property. And uh, I think it's really fun. From time to time, I hear the birds in the background. We just heard the wind blow. But you're recording where you're most comfortable, it sounds like. Yeah, I would say so. And probably the quietest. <laughs> That's great. As you mentioned, I have four kids and a relatively small house, so things can get kind of noisy. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of my major pet peeves in the mainstream survival community is that here's your recipe. Here's your 10 C's. This is exactly what you need to do in any survival situation. These are your priorities. You know, every situation is different. You know, your priorities can be completely turned around depending on your environment, weather, what gear you have with you. You know, it's just, I, it's, it's really hard to answer that specifically. I think that that is why it matters to get out and do it. And people may not always think of building nature skills or wilderness survival skills or bushcraft skills as an adventure sport, but I do. And the reason is because it's so complementary to the things that I love, mountain biking, backpacking, backcountry skiing, all the things that I mentioned before. And sometimes I'll go into the woods not to backpack, but I just go into the woods to practice skills. And I find that to be very entertaining. And you learn so much more about nature when you do that. Yeah, I agree. One of my major stress reliefs um, is just to head out somewhere and make a bow drill fire. You know, there's a lot of energy expended there. And, you know, it, it kind of centers me. You know, if I'm, if I'm in a bad mood, it just kind of brings me back. And, uh, you know, some people have yoga. Some people go mountain biking to, to relax, you know, to get out of a funk. And that's just my thing. So I totally get what you're saying. Oh, yeah. I couldn't agree more. So what types of materials would you recommend for a bow drill fire? Since we brought it up again, let's, let's give people a little bit more information. Uh, again, going back to, it depends on what you have. You know, around here, the pine that we have is not ideal at all because it's mostly short leaf yellow pine. So it has a lot of resin in it. Um, but you go further north, you're going to find white pine, which works pretty good. Um, my personal favorite for that we have around here available to me is mimosa. Um, it, man, it, it will take a coal in 30 seconds almost if you do it right. Um, so I've done a lot of experimenting on what in my area works and what doesn't at least well. You know, I've done anything from hickory, oak, Maple, poplar, and poplar is a popular one. Uh, I it's it's pretty finicky. Um, poplar uh, ages so fast that if you don't catch it in the the exact point where it's it's a prime material, you know it's a pretty short window for it to be a good option. If it if it goes too far, it gets really crumbly, and it's not ideal for a bow drill fire. And if it's not seasoned enough, it's going to be green and wet. So um, you know if you find the right one, it's a good one. But in my area, mimosa is definitely a good one 
further out west, sagebrush is excellent. It's my understanding, I've never done it personally, but my understanding, you basically can cut it down green and make a bow drill with it on the spot. Um, I've used it, but it's only been seasoned that I've used. Well, one reason I wanted to dive into this is just to illustrate for the listeners how deep you can go with the skills. So a bow drill fire, the, the primary components are that you have a drill, which is a shaft of wood that you're going to spin with a bow. And so you're using the string of the bow to spin the wood. So you got to have something to hold the spindle at the top so that, you know, it's not burning your hand, right? And then you also have right. to have a base plate that you spin the wood in where you build up the friction to build the right. coal. Now, some people say that the spindle needs to be a harder wood than the base plate. Some people say it needs to be the same density, same hardness. Other people say, no, no, I like the I like the base plate to be harder than the spindle. What has been your experience? Well, you nailed it when you said, I like. A lot of it is preference, uh, what works best for you. It's... Uh, I've, I've heard that as well. And, you know, people say that this is the, the recipe or the exact way to do it correctly. Um, I don't view that there is a recipe. Uh, the only recipe is going to be the, the function of your body. Um, the most important part of ma- making a bow drill fire successfully is not the wood you're using. It's in the, the function and, and form of your body and the mechanics, uh, learning the muscle memory, and the mechanics to actually successfully do it. Um, if that makes any sense. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, and I love the way you said that because my next point was going to be that the right material to use is what's available when you need to build a fire. Exactly. That's, <laughs> why, I, that's, that's why I've explored it so much because, you know, that, that hypothetical survival situation that many people like to think about, um, us included, you know, if it's truly a survival situation, you know, you're, not, you're likely not going to have the perfect set available to you right there. Um, so, you know, just because you can get a bow drill fire successfully with prime good materials doesn't necessarily mean that if you ever have to rely on that skill, you're going to have those prime materials available. So, it, you know, it kind of pays off or is wise to practice with woods that are harder or less prime. So you know what it takes. So you have the skill built already. So it's not a big deal. Yeah. And we've not even mentioned the tinder to catch the coal and turn it into a flame. We've not mentioned the kindling that's necessary to get that flame to grow into something that's sustainable and even how to prep the wood so wood will burn. It's not a straightforward thing. So why are we diving so deep into all of this? It's just to kind of illustrate that bush skills are more complex than a lot of people may, may think. And that it can be a, a lifelong, enjoyable hobby to learn how to take care of yourself in the wilderness. Precisely. That's cool. Well, let's move on a little bit to some of the gear. You mentioned that you like to hammock camp. And I know a lot of backpackers are kind of curious if that would be a good solution. Let's face it, sleeping on the ground for long periods of time, you get used to it. But it's not like being in bed. And a hammock can be more comfortable, but it can also be cold. What's been your experience? Unless I absolutely have to, I'll never sleep on the ground again. So I've, I've slept in a hammock down to pretty close to zero degrees. And with a bit of adjustment, uh, was able to stay warm and, and cozy warm. It wasn't a struggle. At nighttime here, there's wind is usually at least a constant breeze is going on. Um, and so, you know, one of the main ways to help stay warm, to keep the, the tarp low, you know, keep the walls low to kind of cut that breeze off. Another main thing is have an appropriate sleeping bag. The way I do it is if I'm going to be sleeping on the ground, I would take the same rated bag for whatever temperature into the hammock, but I put a a foam sleeping pad below me to be an insulator between me and the hammock, and that will usually get the job done. So there is one of the, I guess the the cost-weight ratio might be a way to say it. A hammock is lighter than a sleeping pad and can be much more comfortable, but in cold weather, you just mentioned you put the sleeping pad in there anyway. And so right. maybe you're not saving on the weight. But what about the comfort? What do you gain from that? It's a lot more comfortable. Um, I sleep better in a hammock than I do my own bed. And we have a nice bed. So it's, you know, I'm 38. I'm getting older. And I used to be a diesel mechanic for six years. So, you know, I do have aches and pains and things that pop when I stand up. And uh, it's just with a hammock, uh, it just, everything just fits in there perfectly. You know, I sleep like a baby. Well, we like to talk about tips and tricks you know, for any adventure sport. One of mine that I've recently taken up for backpacking is I take a hammock with me even if I'm not planning on sleeping in it. And the reason is that it really is light, just a few ounces for the modern hammocks. 
but it makes a wonderful place just to sit. And yes, I get does. tired of sitting on a log that's uneven or a hard rock that's poking you in the butt. Or, you know, you're trying to sit around a fire and enjoy yourself, and you're always shifting. And, you know, eventually I always give up and go to bed because it's, it's uncomfortable. But that right. hammock makes a beautiful place to sit. It does. And they're simple to set up, a lot more simple than your typical tent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So you would recommend a hammock for people who like to be in the woods then? Anybody and everybody. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. Finally, a bed that senses snoring and automatically responds. Meet the Ergo Smart Base from Tempur-Pedic, our first system that detects snoring, then automatically adjusts by raising the bed. And now during the Tempur-Pedic Summer of Sleep, all Tempur-Pedic mattresses are on sale with savings up to $500 on adjustable sets. Get your best sleep all night, every night. Learn more at TempurPedic.com. At FedEx, we're making carbon capture research our priority because Earth is our priority. Our goal is to be carbon neutral by 2040. We call it Priority Earth. FedEx, where now meets next. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Okay, what other gear recommendations would you have? Oh, boy. Um, (laughs) Well, (laughs) that goes back to your priorities and what you like to do. You know, a lot of what we do in the woods boils down to personal preference. Just because I enjoy it doesn't mean everybody else is going to. Um, As far as other gear recommendations, while we're talking about a hammock, uh, you need to get a good tarp. Um, And doing that, you need to think, okay, you know, how close do I want the fire to be to my hammock set up, you know? If, you know, if it's going to be real close, you probably don't want to go with the, the synthetic materials, you know, go with if it's heavier, go with oil cloth or, you know, do what I do and get a cheap, you know, $4 tarp at Lowe's that will wear out in six months. But I don't have to worry about, you know, blowing coals or anything like that, burning holes in it instantly. So, Joe, do you have a story just about a, a really fun day that you had um, doing bushcraft in the woods? Tell us what the weather was like and, and what was accomplished that day and why you enjoyed it. Uh, well, the first one that pops out in my head is my favorite area around here to hike and backpack. That's a uh, Linville Gorge. Um, I don't know how many people out there are familiar with it, but, um, it's in basically Northern Western North Carolina. Uh, it's uh, just a base, like a miniature Canyon with a, a river running through the middle of it at the bottom. There is several, um, hiking trails that run down into it and run the length of the river. It was the second time I'd ever been in there, I believe. And one of my friends talked me into going down a trail that I hadn't been on, and it's also rated as one of the hardest trails on the eastern seaboard. The folks we were going with, um, there was only three of us that had ever backpacked before. They were from my church, and uh, there's about seven other guys, I think, that went. And so me and the other two fellows that had, that had experience of backpacking and camping and stuff, we overpacked, um, you know, just because we knew that, that the other guys coming weren't going to be fully prepared for a two day overnighter because they'd never done it before, even though we gave them a list of stuff and not everybody had access to the stuff anyway. So we overpacked and I was young and, and uh, silly. I was probably 20, 21 years old. And uh, I ended up, my pack, I weighed it, ended up being about 85 pounds. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And at the time I didn't, we didn't know. Uh, have you heard of the pinch? It's the trail. Uh, it's somewhat famous in this area, but I don't uh, anyway, know. Linville okay. Gorge, I know that one. All right. Well, it's in Linville Gorge, but it's uh, anyway, it's, it's one of the hardest trails on the eastern seaboard. It's around here. It's kind of lives in infamy. At the time, we didn't know it. Uh, it was just looked like a, a shorter trail to get in. So we're going down there, and it's basically rock hopping for two, two and a half miles. It was fun at first. And the scenery was absolutely gorgeous, but uh, yeah, it pretty much burned us out. Took us, I would say about an hour and 45 minutes, two hours to make it down it. And I know you backpack. And so after you've had a hard hike, that's a lot harder than you expected with a lot of weight on your back. Um, you know, you know, our legs were, were shaking really bad. Oh, yeah. And, uh, anyway, there was, we had, we had planned on going another six miles, um, up river to a campground we'd all been at before. Well, all, the three experienced ones of us and, uh, it was real pretty, but it ended up, we were too smoked to do it. The other guys that were with us, um, they, they were, you know, crying uncle. We ended up staying there in, in, in a little meadow that was a couple hundred yards off to the right of the, the trailhead down at the bottom. It, it was just a beautiful area, nice and green, lots of wildlife. Uh, we ended up seeing a bear later that night, uh, lots of raccoons and stuff. I mean, it was just a great time. Um, 
as far as bushcrafting aspects, taught, taught several of the guys how to make a fire. Back then, that was before I had learned the friction fire, but you know, I was fairly familiar with, with uh, fire methods before that, at least from a modern sense. You know, taught several guys how to, how to make fire, improvise a grill for, for some steaks and stuff like that. It was just a good time in camp. Yeah, and it's fun to think back on times like that and the memories. You know, you probably don't remember what you're doing the, the week before that trip, but you remember that trip. Yes, I do. And that's the beauty of adventure sports and getting out there and doing stuff. So what about a time that things didn't go so well? It's one of those stories that makes you feel stupid, um, but, in, but everybody else around you gets a good laugh. Um, I was out on my property. A uh, buddy of mine wanted some fat wood, and you know, there's, there's pine trees around here, and there's fat wood everywhere around here. And for those that don't know, fat wood is basically just um, dead pine where the sap and resins have settled and kind of hardens that dead wood, and they kind of merge, and it's just it's a really good fire material. But anyway, I was out looking for some fat wood for some buddy of mine. I'd been out in the woods basically all day. It was cold. You know, I didn't have a spare battery for my cell phone. Um, I didn't have a spare lights for my flashlight. It got dark, and so. Uh, me being arrogant like I was, you know, hey, I'm basically on my own property. I'm not too terribly far from my house. It's not worried about getting dark. I can finish up digging up this stump and make it home. Uh, about two or three minutes into my walk home in the dark, my flashlight dies. I think, okay, well, no big deal. I grab my cell phone, which has got uh, one of those flashlight apps on it that uses the, the flash from your camera to, to just shine constantly for a flashlight. So I start with that, and then, you know, just a minute or two later, it dies. And so with no, no spare batteries for anything, I'm stuck uh, probably three quarters of a mile, maybe a mile from my house, not being able to see hardly anything. So I start walking in the direction that I quote unquote know my house is, and I keep on going, keep on going, keep on going, and my house never shows up. And so I start, you know, I had to stop and think, all right, well, I can't call out and have my wife holler to, you know, kind of get my bearing. Going back to the beginning of this, you know, like I said, at night around here, all the woods look the same. You know, it's always hilly, you know, the, it's all pine trees for the most part. And so it, it, there's no real landmarks unless you know the property really well. But at nighttime with no light, you can't see them anyway. I ended up finding a clear enough spot to find the moon and relating it to where I'm pretty sure where it should be if I'm looking at it from my house. And I walk towards a road that I know is there. And then I get to the road eventually and walk home. <laughs> so on your own property, yes. that just goes to show how easy it is to uh, to have an adventure you didn't expect to get turned around. On your own property, you ran out of light and lost sense of direction. That can happen so easily. Yes. Well, it's one of those stories, like I said, where everybody laughs but you. My wife had a gr good old laugh when I got home. I'm sure. But you know what? You did make a lot of sense. You found a clearing where you could see the sky, and you knew how to read the sky enough to get your get your bearings, get your directions. So that's yep. good advice for anyone who's out there. Uh, if, if you know your environment. I was fortunate in that, you know, I live here. I wasn't so far from my home that the angle of the moon was going to be different than what I'm used to. And honestly, I was pretty fortunate that I remembered about where it should be for the, you know, for what I'm used to seeing so I could get it because, you know, the angle of the moon changes on a daily basis. So, you know, it was one of those luck things there. So I was lucky as, as much as I was, you know, thinking ahead. Oh, yeah. You know, I have similar stories. I think anyone who spends time in the woods does, but I've realized that my sense of direction is not very good, Joe. So I've spent quite a bit of time learning how to read the stars and, and read the sun and the moon and that sort of thing so that I can get a sense of direction from my environment because my natural sense of direction is so poor. An example, I took my 13-year-old son backpacking, and we were about seven miles into the Colorado Rockies, and we had ended up camping off trail. And as we cut back through the woods to get to a trail, um, we were huffing and puffing up a, a serious grade at probably almost 12,000 feet. And I'm just fighting my way through, and my son finally says, where are you going? <laughs> and I turn around and look at him. I go, what do you mean? I'm going to the trail. He goes, no, you're not. His sense of direction is excellent. So I had to stop and look around at the lay of the land and what I knew about the, the area, and then I realized he was completely correct. And so I had to turn over 90 degrees from the direction that I was walking so that we could intersect the trail. Um, it's oh, so wow. easy to get turned around, especially for someone like me who doesn't have that great sense of direction. But uh, he certainly does. So he saved our skins. Yeah, it, it, I mean, getting lost even in, in a familiar area, if you're not paying attention, it can happen to anybody. I mean, even if you are paying attention, it can still happen. So, um, 
it's definitely something to keep in your mind to be prepared for, at least mentally. Um, keep track, keep track of the landmarks. If you're walking somewhere, keep track of your landmarks. So when you want to go back that direction, you at least have a general idea of if you're right on track or not. Yeah. And I think getting lost is probably the number one thing that happens to people when they start doing things in nature. Um, that, that is a threatening situation. And it doesn't have to be life-threatening. I often say, you know, attitude is, is everything. And if you find that you don't know exactly where you are, it doesn't mean you don't know how to get out, right? Exactly. You just have to kind of keep your mental attitude positive And like you said, assess the situation and sort out what the best plan of action is. And in some cases, the best plan of action might be to stay put. Yep, I Um, agree totally. uh, It might be to be just where you are and and try to make some sort of a signal fire or, or get found in some way. But sometimes you have to rely completely upon yourself. And that means you're going to have to choose a direction and you're going to have to be able to maintain that direction and move. And uh, there's a lot to that, a lot that can be learned. So I agree completely. And taking it a step further, and I, I realize it's not as flashy and it's not a popular solution, at least when we're theorizing about those survival situations. But, you know, we live in a modern age. Um, you know, there's no reason not to, not to have a cell phone with you. And yes, I realize that not areas of the country are, you know, blanketed in, in cell phone coverage. But it's not that uncommon. And, you know, if you do get into that situation, use your phone. I mean, that's, that should be your first thing. If you have signal, call for help. <laughs> sure, you bet. Do the obvious stuff first, right? But exactly. it's always fun to have the skill set so that if everything else fails, you know that you and nature will be okay. That nature is your second home and that you may not get out when you expected to, but you can still get out safely and have a fun experience in the process. I agree wholeheartedly. Well, Joe, do you have any parting thoughts for us, advice for people that would like to... Uh, get into bushcraft and learn more about how to work with nature instead of against her? First step, in my opinion, uh, again, probably not a a popular answer. A lot of people are going to point you to books, you know, by Nesmick or Kephart or Sears. I would suggest if you're interested in beginning, it's free. Go to YouTube, watch a lot of videos. Keep in mind that not everybody owns the skill that they try to try to portray or try to teach. Um, So watch a lot of different folks. Don't just watch one. Get used to the activities. Find where you want to start. Something that stands out to you, whether it be fire or shelter or, you know, camp cooking or something like that. Find an area where you want to start and prioritize. What do I need to learn this skill? What do I need to own this skill? How do I need to practice? Um, And, you know, while learning these skills is, you know, it's romantic to look at doing it out in the woods as the proper way to do it. There's no reason why you can't learn them in your backyard or your patio on your apartment. Find what you like and go from there. And then as you get into it, if like me and a lot of other people, when you start learning, it will become more than just something you're learning or a hobby. It will become a passion and your search for growth in that area will expand. Something that I think is a a huge benefit that people probably all find out about but may not expect in the beginning. They think they're going out to learn survival skills in the woods, but what they're really doing is they're, they're learning how to work with nature. And I have said that several times, but... When you get more familiar with the natural environment around you, then, wow, there's so many benefits to that. It's so good for the spirit. It's so good for health. It recenters a person. And like you mentioned, stress relief. There are so many ways that just going into the woods helps. And I, I tell people, man, if all you ever do is go out, lay down and look at the sky through the trees, you'll find that that's a different experience and something that will add significantly to your enjoyment of life in general, I think. I agree wholeheartedly. It's, uh, you know, like I've, like I've mentioned earlier, you know, just going out and whipping a, a bow fire or just sitting at the base of a tree and watching nature, listening to nature. It's, you know, some people have yoga, some people have mountain biking or whatever. This is a, my form of relaxation and stress relief. Well, very cool. Well, Joe, thank you for giving us an introduction into feral woodcraft or bushcraft or nature craft or wilderness survival, however you want to <laughs> say it. There are lots of different ways to say it, but the information that you gave us is is sound, and I think it's a great place to start. And all the listeners out there, I do encourage you, if you love adventure sports, then learn some necessary survival skills, and you might find a whole new hobby of bushcraft along the way. So, Joe, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun talking to you and talking about my passion. <laughs> right on. And for all of our listeners out there, until the next show, get out there and have some fun. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to the show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. 
You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. A lot of us are looking for ways to start our day feeling more joy and appreciation. And while some of us write gratitude lists or do yoga, others pour themselves a bowl of their favorite cereal, Honey Nut Cheerios. Because not only are Honey Nut Cheerios delicious, they can help lower cholesterol as part of a heart-healthy diet. So maybe the secret to a great mood all day is a little yoga. Then writing your gratitude list over a bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios. Learn more about a heart-healthy lifestyle at Cheerios.com. Worried about mom or dad falling? The Symphony Medical Alert System from CVS Health helps make their home safer, even if you can't be there. Symphony works with voice activation or a care button they can opt to wear, along with smart sensors for coverage around the home. With 24-7 emergency response and an app to tie it all together, you can monitor your loved one's well-being for enhanced peace of mind. Terms and conditions apply. Learn more about Symphony at cvs.com symphony or find it at your nearest CVS Health Hub.